we're really happy to see such a great turnout on it, what is a really important topic. So tonight we'll have a panel of expert speakers here for you and they'll go through their presentations and then after their presentations we'll have uh, roughly about 30 minutes for Q&A. So uh, if you can hold your questions until the end, just don't forget them and we'll make sure that we get a good dialogue going. Uh, so let me run through some brief introductions for you. The uh, first speaker is Dr. Edward Oldfield. He's a physician here, professor of medicine at Eastern Virginia Medical School in microbiology and molecular cell biology. He is our go-to infectious disease guy, and uh, he'll be providing a medical update. Uh, in the empty seat next to him, coming down the aisle, thank you, yay. <laughs> I was trying to wait for you. This is Dr. Dimitri Lindsay. <laughs> And Dr. Lindsay is the director of the Norfolk Health Department and also the Virginia Beach Health Department. She's also a physician, and she'll be talking with us tonight from the public health department uh, perspective. Next is Dr. Joel Bundy. Dr. Bundy is a physician and is the chief quality and safety officer for the Centera Healthcare System. And he'll be talking about the hospital's response or from a health uh, service provider response standpoint. Uh, next is Mr. James Reddick. Uh, Mr. Reddick is director of the Department of Emergency Preparedness and Response for the City of Norfolk. And so as you can imagine, that's a big undertaking to prepare cities. And so he'll be speaking from that perspective. And last but not least on the end is Dr. Glenn Yap. Uh, Dr. Yap is a faculty member in the Master of Public Health program. And Glenn will be talking about the economic impact of the COVID-19 or coronavirus. So, I think we have a pretty broad spectrum of panelists for you with expertise, and we'll give you some great background. Without further ado, we'll get started with Dr. Oldfield. Thank you. Good evening. So we're going to do an update on COVID-19. It was initially called the novel coronavirus, but obviously that can't last very long. So they uh, named it the SARS coronavirus 2. It's got about a 90% genetic sequence homology with the original SARS virus. So it's really considered in the same species. And like we have HIV, the virus, and AIDS, the disease, the disease itself is called COVID-19 or coronavirus disease 2019. So our virus here and the disease, uh, first reported case December 31st. They really traced it back to probably December the 1st. To date, over 95,000 reported cases. I would suspect you can multiply by 10 or 20 to get a closer estimate of what's going on. 3,200 deaths, now about 220 outside of China. And importantly, um, 1,800 cases in healthcare workers in China with six fatalities. So about 3.5% of all of the cases are healthcare workers. Now we have 13,000 cases outside of China in 81 different countries. Uh, you wonder about a pandemic. It's a pandemic when WHO says it is. So 81 countries is a lot. This is the seventh straight day with more transmission outside of China than inside China. South Korea uh, and now has more cases every day than China. China only had 120-some cases reported uh, yesterday. Iran's up to 3,000 cases and Italy 2,500. For the U.S., when I gave this talk at 3 o'clock, it was 128 cases. Uh, now it looks like 149 cases. 48 were repatriated. They were diagnosed overseas and brought back, including 45 from Diamond Princess. We have now cases from 14 states uh, with 11 deaths. And we have a case in um, North Carolina that actually visited that nursing home in uh, Washington State. Uh, that was diagnosed in Wake County. So this actually was yesterday. 104 cases, and you can see how markedly this changes and ramps up uh, just over a short period of time. But the bulk of the cases are in California and Washington State. Uh, the cases in Rhode Island were a group of students who were on a, a field trip to uh, Italy who became ill and brought it back. Uh, there have been four different countries that have had tourists from uh, Egypt diagnosed with COVID-19, and you wonder if they're hiding the epidemic uh, so it doesn't impact tourism. This is this uh, going on in Washington State now. Uh, that's obviously the 27 cases, nine deaths is different already. But the first case that was ever diagnosed in the United States, actually it turns out that a case about six weeks later 
they had essentially identical viruses. So the feeling is that this virus has been circulating in Washington State for six weeks without being discovered. Uh, the outbreak is unfortunately centered at a life care center, uh, an assisted living, which is the worst scenario you could have with people with comorbidities and older. And there are at least 50 um, residents and staff that are ill and are uh, hospitalized. Uh, also, we see person-to-person -person spread in, North, in California in two areas that have no connection to any other cases, and also in Oregon. The mean incubation is about 5.2 days. The 95th percentile is 12 and a half days, and that's how we got to that 14 days of quarantine. This has a, a doubling time of seven days and a basic reproductive number of 2.2. So every patient, on average, infects 2.2 more people. If you have a reproductive number one or less, that's going to be self-limited. Over two, you're going to have an epidemic. You can bend that curve if you do source control, you quarantine people, you do contact tracing, uh, but right now we're certainly at least at 2.2. Uh, this all started in Wuhan. Uh, Wuhan is a city of 11 million people, larger than metropolitan New York City, and it's the capital of Hubei province with 58.5 million people. That entire province has been completely locked down. Nobody in, nobody out. Uh, early uh, in the outbreak, they were going through 100,000 single-use isolation suits a day. So you can imagine what this is going to do to uh, protective equipment for physicians if it gets going here. They've uh, taken 25,000 medical personnel from outside Hubei and transferred them there to help. And the central government built two 1,000-bed hospitals in less than two weeks. So this is what Hubei looks like, I mean, Wuhan. And where did it all start? It started in what we call a wet market. Uh, basically, uh, it's called Huanan Market. It's a really scruffy complex, thousands of stalls spread over the size of nine football fields selling numerous species of wild animals, civets, bamboo rats, ostriches. There have been 33 positive uh, coronavirus isolates from the western part of the market where they keep the mammals. Uh, Chinese law actually allows the raising of 54 different species to sell for consumption. That market was closed on January the 1st. All these wild animal markets in China were closed on January 26th. I have heard that the Chinese government is going to ban them from reopening, but this is so intrinsic to uh, traditional Chinese culture that I don't think it's going to happen, and I think as long as those wild markets are open, we're going to do this over and over. So this is what it looks like. Uh, this is a pile of bamboo rats for sale here. Uh, this, what they have is these cages uh, filled with mammals of different species stacked on top of each other, and the keepers will sleep on top of the cages or next to it. Uh, you can see it's a perfect milieu for transmitting viruses from species to species. Uh, the original SARS outbreak was traced back to a civet cat. These are considered a delicacy in China, and the Chinese believe that you get some kind of transference of the spirit of the animal when you eat them, and the longer they're alive before you eat them, the more transference. So they like to keep the animal alive. So these were kept alive in the restaurants, and they wouldn't be slaughtered until you ordered them. But the real source for all of these coronaviruses are bats. Uh, this is a Chinese horseshoe bat, which was the source of both the SARS virus and our new SARS-2. Uh, also, we are in the midst of an outbreak with uh, the MERS uh, outbreak in Saudi Arabia in the Arabian Peninsula. This is a situation where the virus, coronavirus, has been transferred from bats to camels and now camels to humans. And this outbreak is still going on right now with over 2,500 cases and a 35% mortality. Now, the closest we can come to the source of this virus uh, is the pangolin. And a pangolin is an armored anteater. These are considered a delicacy, the meat in China, and the scales are used yes. in traditional Chinese medicine. Chinese uh, it is an medicine. endangered species, and it's the most trafficked of all endangered species in the world. And you can see them here in cages, uh, right up next to uh, cages full of uh, snakes. But that's not all. Bats have 
Over 500 different coronaviruses have been found in bats. They're also the source of rabies, Marburg, Ebola, Hendra virus, Nipah virus, SARS, and MERS-CoV, and I'm sure it's not going to end there. So what a little bit about coronaviruses. Uh, there have been seven coronaviruses that cause disease in humans. There are four that basically are endemic in the United States, and they cause the common cold about 10 to 30 percent. Um, there's SARS, we talked about 10 percent mortality, and MERS with 35 percent. So what about transmissibility? Uh, <clears throat> the feeling is that almost all of the transmission is by droplet, so we're talking three to six feet. We're talking about contamination of surfaces, get on your clothes, your hands, and then self-inoculating. We cannot rule out airborne, but it looks like by far the most is droplet transmission. This slide's very interesting. On the y-axis, you have mortality, and you can see at the top you've got MERS, Ebola, and bird flu. <coughs> on the bottom, you've got the common cold, and then on the x-axis, you've got contagious. Uh, and you notice measles has a reproductive number of 15 to 18 versus 2. This, that's incredibly airborne contagious. In that little box are the estimates of both the uh, mortality and the <coughs> infectivity. For the seasonal, well, let's go back to pandemic flu in 2009. Mortality was 0.02 percent, so two deaths per 10,000 cases. <coughs> seasonal flu is about 0.2, so two per thousand. It looks like uh, COVID-19 is about 2 percent. <clears throat> this is the real issue here. If you have cases that are fatal or they're really sick, they don't excrete virus until they get sick then you can get them, do source control, contact tracing, and you can literally control the epidemic like SARS. But if you're at the bottom of this triangle where you have large numbers of asymptomatic people that continue to go around about their daily business and are infectious, then you're not going to control it. And that's where we are with COVID-19. So this is just one example here. This was a business meeting in Germany, a um, person attended from China infected patient one, she was completely asymptomatic, patient two, and then patients three and four were infected by patient one. No symptoms in the original case. So according to the first major report from China, about 80 percent of cases are mild, very large quantities in the upper respiratory tract, especially in the nares. In fact, quantitative viral counts in the nares in asymptomatic people are as high as those with severe symptoms. About 15% require hospitalization, 3 to 5% end up in the ICU, and it's about a 2% mortality. About a quarter in the ICU are going to end up, uh, actually in China, they've ended up on ECMO, an extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. But what about clinical? The incubation is about the same for all three of these coronaviruses. Uh, fever in the symptomatic ones in almost all, but notice only 44 percent on presentation. Uh, cough is very common, myalgias, fatigue. Uh, if you're going to get sicker, usually about eight days you start getting short of breath and then full-blown acute respiratory stress syndrome about nine days. Diarrhea relatively rare and very common are bilateral CT involvement, usually described as ground glass. Uh, this is a patient on day eight with these multiple ground glass and filtrates, uh, and on day 15, obviously much more severe. So the patients who have died in mainland China, over 80% were older than 60. 75% had an underlying condition. So this, in younger people, is going to be more like the influenza or the common cold. For people my age, uh, it's, it's going to be a serious uh, disease. And if you break this down, you can see that below 50, the mortality is very, very low, but then it ramps up 4%, then 8%, then over 80 is 15%, and then comorbidities, uh, cardiovascular disease, 10% mortality, diabetes, 7 chronic lung disease, uh, 6%. So the worst case scenario was what we saw in Washington and Kirkland, where we had an assisted living facility with people with chronic diseases, and they were older, and most of the people who have died in that facility were 70 and 80 years old. So diagnosis, 
it turns out that actually nasal swab is um, just as good as oropharyngeal and as good as uh, lower uh, respiratory samples. Only about 30% even have a cough. And you really, you know, if you're going to induce a sputum or do a bronchoalveolar lavage, you're going to have aerosolization. So for my money, I would do a nasal swab for uh, PCR. You want to collect acute and convalescent serum, and we do not want people attempting viral culture. If you feel you might have a suspect case, you want to contact the public health department uh, in your local city. Testing is going to be done at uh, State Public Health Lab at DCLS in Richmond although I can tell you they don't have many tests or kits. Uh, their uh, results are going to have to be verified at CDC. And then you want to contact your local Centera lab so they know how to handle the specimen and how to ship it. Uh, current testing is by PCR, so we're directly testing for virus. Antibody tests are being developed. Those will be important to determine prevalence, go back through a population, see how many people actually got infected. Uh, initial test kits for PCR were di distributed by CDC in February, and they were faulty. They all had to be recalled and then redone and sent out again. Uh, CDC had done 3,300 tests as of March the 1st. Uh, they've shipped 47 cases, uh, kits around the United States. Uh, but interestingly, on Monday, they removed all the data on their testing from their website. And you wonder if it had gotten so political about the number of tests and their capabilities that they just stopped it. Uh, Vice President Pence told reporters in an off-camera briefing, we're issuing clear guidance that's subject to doctor's orders. Any American can be tested. And this afternoon, it looks like the CD web, C website was changed in a way that would suggest that, although it would be unfortunate if we had a lot of worried wounded demanding to be tested by their doctors and overwhelming the testing for the people that really need to be. So from my perspective, I would still follow the CDC guidance, which will go over the original guidance. So treatment, none is proven effective. Uh, steroids, uh, no effect on mortality. They uh, do delay viral clearance. Although it's becoming clear what's happening to people, it's not bacterial post-infection. It's really a cytokine storm. They have just astronomical levels of multiple different cytokines, and that's what's killing them, sending them into ARDS and septic shock. So I don't know if steroids um, could possibly benefit. Ribavirin by itself is not very good. Interestingly, the, the protease inhibitor for HIV, Kaletra, had really good activity, and uh, there, was a, there were studies in SARS that showed good activity. So if I had a case now, I would treat them with Kaletra, depending anything else. And ribavirin is synergistic with Kaletra. Remdesivir is an adenosine analog that is experimental, that there are now trials going on in China. And favipiravir is an um, antiviral broad spectrum that looks like it's having good activity in China. So infection prevention and control. Uh, I think this is really important, this tale of two cities. This goes back to the original SARS. In Vancouver, they had a case come in, and within 15 minutes, full respiratory precautions were instituted, and that's called source control. They gave them a mask, put them in a private room, transferred them to a negative pressure uh, isolation room, then admitted to the ICU in negative pressure with full precautions. During that whole episode, only one nurse was infected, and she did not wear eye protection. There were no secondary cases. There were three more imported cases of SARS into Vancouver with no secondary transmission. Contrast that with Toronto. Uh, the initial uh, woman was exposed to a doctor, a nephrologist in Hong Kong. She returned to Toronto. She died at home. Her son went to the emergency department, spent 18 hours in an open observation area, receiving nebulized salbutamol, so there's your aerosolization, and died in the ICU five days later. Two people on each side of that patient in the ED were infected, went out and had clusters associated with them and eventually 27,000 people were quarantined, 438 cases of SARS, and 44 deaths. It's all about recognition and source control. <clears throat> so this is an interesting comment. The management of cases evolved through a period, and this is for SARS, of profound fear and emotional distress experienced by healthcare workers with potentially fatal nosocomial transmission. After implementation of specific rigorous protective measures, there were no known nosocomial transmissions of SARS 
to the 211 healthcare workers in the ICU. So with proper uh, use of protective equipment, I think we can prevent uh, transmission to healthcare workers. So we want source control. That's by far a key number one. Before arrival, uh, actually, the best thing would be, in, and since there's no treatment, if the patient's not seriously ill and needs supportive care, you just stay at home. Uh, if they do need to come in, then before arrival, instruct the patient uh, to call ahead, wear a face mask, which they can pick up in the lobby. And I think we all need to make sure that those um, face mask stands are not being robbed by uh, people trying to get their own stores. Uh, you want to adhere to cough etiquette, cough in a, a tissue. If you don't have a tissue, cough into your elbow. Uh, hand hygiene, they're talking about washing our hands 10 to 12 times a day. Uh, ensure that they do not wait among other patients seeking care. Uh, isolate them uh, in an airborne infection isolation room. If you don't have one of those, and put them in a single room. And you need to keep a log of everybody that goes into that room. Uh, as far as healthcare providers, we want to use airborne precautions with an N95 mask. Interesting, WHO is still recommending a surgical mask. You want contact precautions, gowns, gloves. You want eyewear protection, either a face shield or goggles. Uh, eyeglasses are not adequate. Uh, and high hygiene, either an alcohol-based product that's 60% alcohol or more, or soap and water for at least 20 seconds. These are the current guidelines for testing. Uh, basically, if you have symptoms on the left-hand side uh, and you've had close contact with a laboratory confirmed case in the last 14 days, a uh, history of travel from one of the affected geographic areas, and we'll show that on the next slide, what CDC is recommending. And then for severe respiratory illness, that there's no source of exposure that you've been able to identify. So these are the areas where you want to take a good travel history. China, Iran, Italy, Japan, and South Korea. And I think we could probably add um, Washington State, Seattle area to that. Uh, certainly that's what they would say in North Carolina with their case. So just a, a few sidelines. 50% of surgical masks are produced in China. Uh, we only have 17 million N95 masks in the U.S. stockpile, and about 5 million of those are already expired. Estimated we'll need 300 million N95 masks for this if there's an outbreak. There's already been a hundredfold increase in demand for these uh, respirators and gowns, 20-fold increase in price, and four- to six-month backlog in production. Interestingly, Purell last summer for eight ounces was 785. On Amazon yesterday, it was 115, and on today, it's not available. So it's estimated that a severe influenza pandemic would require mechanical ventilators for 740,000 people. Uh, our country has 62,000 full-featured ventilators, and most of them are in use. Uh, there are 10,000 in the strategic national stockpile, but certainly not enough. So basically what we have now, we have an outbreak. We certainly have an epidemic. Uh, we'll have a pandemic when WHO decides to declare it. What we're concerned about is this virus becoming endemic. And then basically we have a recurring outbreak every year like we have the other four except a much more severe disease. So this is cross the species barrier. It's made one step to mankind. Let's hope it doesn't make the giant leap to all mankind. And I'll just end with uh, this. This you notice is from 2006. <laughs> Uncertainty during a pandemic will drive many of the outcomes we fear, including panic among the public, unpredictable and unilateral actions by governments, instability in markets, and potentially devastating impacts on the economy. The need for timely, accurate, credible, and consistent information that is tailored to specific audiences is critical. So we have to keep the information timely, accurate, credible and consistent. With that, I'll stop. And I think we're going to hold the questions till the end. Is that right?
Good evening. I was asked to speak to you on the public health response to this uh, outbreak. Um, a, a number of the slides that I've covered, uh, thankfully, Dr. Oldfield has already covered, so I'll be kind of moving along through some uh, fairly quickly. I uh, just wanted to make note that, you know, we, we are facing a, a, an outbreak in a different world than in the past. Uh, we have a global society where you can move around the world and within hours. So uh, this places a, a new factor on the potential for spread of these infections. And Dr. Oldfield talked a bit about pandemic criteria, uh, the fact that we don't have an absolute um, uh, definition of when we have one and don't have one. But these are some of the criteria that we cons are concerned about, uh, the fact that it it is a new agent that um, has infected the human population, so there's virtually no immunity uh, by anyone. Um, it has having the potential to cause severe illness and death, sustained person-to-person -person transmission, both of which we are seeing, uh, and the potential for worldwide spread. Dr. Ophill covered this. Um, this is a comparison to COVID-19 and also MERS and SARS uh, infections. And uh, here, I just wanted to point out that um, we've talked about the case fatality rate, the estimation of it based on what we know currently, but also in terms of transmissibility, even though we're on the lower end of the spectrum and kind of moving forward here as we talk somewhere around the transmissibility of influenza, um, oh, I don't know how to back up, mm -hmm. obviously, apparently. Um, oh, here. Um, the number of total cases has far exceeded what we've seen with SARS and MERS. <coughs> Moving along, um, I want to talk about, on a national scale, the strategic objectives identified uh, by the World Health Organization focused on identifying, isolating, and caring for patients early reducing transmission from the animal source, understanding the nature of the virus. Dr. Oldfield talked extensively about what we do know about the nature of the virus at this point, uh, communicate critical risk, and minimize social and economic impact. Then uh, uh, moving to U.S. public health response, uh, one of the, the major things that you've see, been seeing coming out from the public are travel no notices and suspensions. At this point, entry to the U.S. by foreign nationals uh, from China and Iran uh, who have been in those countries within the past 14 days uh, has been suspended. Also, U.S. residents and citizens and their family members who were in China in the past 14 days must go undergo health monitoring and may have movement restrictions. Uh, airport screening has been basically funneled through 11 U.S. airports and those individuals must go undergo health assessments. If they're uh, symptomatic, um, they will undergo further evaluation, isolation, and treatment as indicated. Asymptomatic travelers from the Hubei province uh, must undergo mandatory quarantine, as you've seen in the media. And asymptomatic travelers may be uh, allowed to uh, continue on to their final destination for public health monitoring which is where we come in. Of note here, in terms of steps that have been taken, I wanted to point out that on 2-7 of this year, of February 7th, the State Health Commissioner, Dr. Norman Oliver, declared a public health, a communicable disease of public health threat for the state of Virginia, um, based on um, the, current, the state at that time of COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, that allows um, the state to access uh, certain measures under the Code of Virginia, which includes uh, involuntary quarantine and also the potential to access needed resources to fight this outbreak. The public health response in Virginia has been extensive and it's revving up and um, proceeds and changes every day. We have established an incident command uh, management teams uh, at both the state and local levels with incident action plans, daily and weekly sit reps, um, and, um, and uh, reports. 
with very wide distribution. Many of you may have received letters or notifications. There's coordination at multiple levels uh, with operation briefings and um, also a person under, under in investigation or PUI case management, education, and um, pre preparation for potential further spread. Um, there has been a comprehensive public information campaign initiated, uh, including a two-on-one call center, uh, a web page, targeted communications to clinicians, and targeted education efforts. I wanted to pause for a minute and talk a little bit about isolation and quarantine. Uh, most of us are familiar with isolation, even if we may not know the term. We do it every day. You see it in hospitals with signs. This represents the separation of the ill or those who are known or expected to be ill with some type of communicable disease. Um, however, um, and in addition to hospitals, we also do it at work. When, when an individual is advised or chooses to stay at home from school or work, um, it generally is the type of um, isolation is based on disease transmission. Uh, currently, um, we are advising standard airborne and contact precaution for this outbreak. Quarantine is a bit different. It, it is used less commonly, um, and it involves restriction of the asymptomatic who appear to be well but may potentially have been exposed to a communicable disease. Involuntary um, quarantine is used often by public health in such settings as tuberculosis. Um, our efforts are to use the least restrictive type of quarantine that may be effective. Involuntary quarantine requires the authority of the state health commissioner under uh, the, um, the public health, the declaration of a public health uh, threat. And then the local public health response involves uh, human surveillance and investigation. On a regular basis, we receive required reportable disease reports from labs, hospitals, and clinicians. Uh, so most clinicians are familiar with this. Um, this is another uh, outbreak that does require reporting by clinicians. We are also receiving on a twice daily basis CDC travel listings of individuals who may have come into the country from affected areas uh, with travel advisories, particularly mainland China and Hubei province. Also surveillance, sy syndromic surveillance, looking at levels of hospital admissions for various types of syndromes or emergency room visits. Support to clinicians has been a very active and, and has ramped up significantly since this outbreak. Uh, we are in, in continuous consultation with healthcare providers uh, regarding cases of and patients that they are seeing. Um, approval is required from the health department to, for any lab testing, which, as Dr. Ofield mentioned, is currently uh, being done at DCLS prior to this weekend. Uh, it could only be done at the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, with a recent ability for DCLS to conduct those lab testings, we've gone from a turnaround time of approximately two days to a week for lab results to three to five hours. And also, uh, in support of physicians, we are providing regular updates to hospitals and physicians. I'll talk a little bit more about PUI case management and coordination with hospitals. Uh, Dr. Oldfield went into this. This is what we call patient under investigation criteria. A patient under investigation is an individual who may be symptomatic or meet this criteria for which we would approve testing. And you'll note there um, that uh, it does include the consideration now of uh, cases in which there may not be an, an actual um, confirmed contact or geographic uh, history, but suspicion based on the clinical history. And um, those individuals can be 
approved for testing on a case-by-case -case basis. I'll move on here, I talked about that. Uh, surveillance and investigations. Uh, currently, we have no cases of COVID-19 diagnosed in Virginia. You can see here a total number of 11 patients have been tested. Most of those are in northern and central Virginia. And here, I'm going to move on. Um, this is kind of a, a breakdown of the exposure risk criteria, movement restrictions, and travel restrictions. I will move on from this in the interest of time to local monitor, movement and monitoring activity. So as I mentioned at the local level, the public health department is responsible for monitoring those individuals who may have had some type of, of risk identified when they entered the country or for other reasons inside the country uh, who are not at high risk but at medium to low risk. Uh, this is usually self-monitoring or supervised monitoring. It involves an initial interview to identify the patient's history, assess their risks and symptomatology, and also to ensure that we review procedures for them to understand what things to look for, how to monitor their temperature and other symptoms, uh, to report that information out, and to know what to happen if they should develop symptoms. They are advised to call ahead either to the health department or to uh, advise 911 or the hospital that they're coming in if they develop symptoms. Also, the, the health department is responsible for ensuring that it's, if a patient is under active monitoring, either um, under generally under in voluntary quarantine, we must ensure that their basic needs can be met. And that includes uh, whether or not they have uh, housing, whether or not they need food, medication, anything that they may need to ensure that they are able to uh, comply with the quarantine status. Operations, uh, travel monitoring, this is just a breakdown of uh, individuals who have been monitored and how many. Uh, currently, um, there are 218 individuals who have completed monitoring in Virginia and 95 that are currently under monitoring. This is a, a list of uh, interim guidance that and I would encourage you to go to the CDC website for specific information. So we are at a point really that what we're doing is as much as possible trying to slow transmission uh, within the community um, to prevent the possibility of sustained com community transmission in the U.S. Um, it is a high likelihood that we will eventually have sustained transmission. We want to slow that process as much as possible until we have treatment options available. So building on uh, pandemic preparedness in the past, this is something that the, health, the public health has had a lot of experience with. This is a new agent. There are lots of things that we still need to learn. Um, but it appears to be spreading in similar fashion to past flu um, epidemics that we've seen. We've um, had extensive experience with preparedness going back since 2004. And that includes um, such efforts as the H1N1 outbreak, an actual event, uh, regular, almost yearly exercises, also includes uh, those drive-through flu shots or flu shot clinic events. Those are all designed to be able to prepare for a large-scale outbreak. Uh, VDH reviews uh, pandemic flu plans and guidances on a regular basis, and we also work with our partners to ensure that they may are up to date on their plans as well. Dr. Ophill covered this. So non-pharmaceutical interventions are what we have uh, at our disposal to try to slow this epidemic. I want to emphasize that this um, preparedness and the effort right now is a, is a responsibility of our entire society, not just public health, not just the hospitals, or first responders. We want everyone to take what steps they can 
to reduce the potential for transmission and includes schools, businesses, our local communities, as well as our health professionals. So what can partner agencies do? Maintain open lines of communication with your local health department. Um, review emergency operations plans, pan pandemic flu plans if applicable, and continuity of operation plans. I want to emphasize that as we um, important to review workplace policies, particularly around sick leave. That's not just a formal policy, but also thinking about the informal messages that we communicate at our workplaces in terms of whether or not an individual should take sick leave um, if they are ill. Many, in many cases, we see individuals who feel that they are indisposable and can't take leave when they're ill. They come to work, infect others, and we end up having more people out, more absenteeism due to presenteeism uh, from uh, those individuals. Maintain situational awareness through trusted sources. Information is constantly changing. I um, would encourage you to use the VDH website or the CDC website to be up to date on current information. Take home messages. The current risk of COV, uh, COVID-19 infection to the American public in the um, immediacy is considered low, um, but we do know that um, the risk of widespread community uh, transmission in the, in the future um, is a risk. It is a rapidly evolving situation, and interim guidance will continue to change. The information that I have in terms of numbers uh, was changing throughout the day today, and every day I do a presentation, it has changed. Um, we advise that individuals to maintain vigilance, frequent communication and coordination become, among partners is critical, and uh, promote flu and respiratory infection prevention. I'm going to move on from this. These are some of the, the, uh, the knowledge gaps that we have now. There's a lot that we have learned. Um, we have had some challenges with getting early information out of China, uh, but we are progressively learning about this infection and how to fight it. Uh, but we still have more uh, to, to learn in terms of the pathogenesis and virulence, evolution of the virus, the dynamics of transmission, viral shedding. Um, um, in terms of transmission, um, the role of fecal-oral transmission is, is something that has come up based on some um, cases in China, the risk of uh, factors for infection, and seasonality of this uh, outbreak. Wanted to take a minute to point out that we are still at widespread activity for influenza, and this is probably our biggest immediate threat. However, the steps that one would take to slow transmission are the basic measures that we need to follow for this and other outbreaks. Frequent hand washing, uh, coughing and covering coughs, including coughing into the sleeve um, rather than your hands where you may transfer the infection to other surfaces, and reviewing, as I mentioned, workplace practices. So I'll stop there. Good evening, everybody. I would just say that um, one of the most important things that we're doing at Centera is we're talking to our partners. And our team, talking to everybody at the front of this table here, and we're doing that every single day. And I, I actually, Dr. Oldfield was presenting to one of our groups earlier today, and I was struck by the fact that his slides were up to date when he spoke to us, and he had to change them by the time he got here. So things are rapidly changing every single day. Um, one of the things that we realized at Centera was that what we had to do, we had to think of our patients, but not just the patients, the people that work for us, our employees, and the medical staff. And everything we do, regardless of how we're working through that, we have that top of mind. So how do we make sure that we keep our patients safe and we keep our employees safe 
and we keep our medical staff safe. So when we started to do this, it was three weeks into COVID-19, we said, you know, we need to really get our arms wrapped around this because if we don't, it'll be here and we won't be prepared. So we put together a multidisciplinary team um, pretty early on in January. And on that team, we have operational leaders, we have physicians, we have nurses, infection prevention, we have very, very importantly, materials management to make sure that we do have our supplies, that we have our PPE, everything that we definitely need there. We have pharmacy and lab, um, and we have a process improvement engineer because we realized that things that we were going to do, we were probably going to have to change. And I will tell you that we meet every single day, a team of us meet every single day, and we make plans and we implement those plans. We put them into practice. Very importantly, and from those who study high reliability organizations, we have to listen to the people that are actually doing the things. And so they give us feedback. And so today I was on calls with emergency physicians, and they said, you know what, it's really not working out that way. We need to pivot. Because we want to make sure that what we do and what we think is the right thing, we can actually do operationally. Again, keeping in mind that we want to keep our patients safe and our employees safe and our uh, medical staff safe. So we put together this team and we said, well, we'll contain things. And, and I think you've heard that containment's hard. Um, we can try to do those things, so we will contain and we'll try to mitigate as best we can. We do a really, really good job of making sure that we um, identify patients. So in Epic, when you come in, doesn't matter whether you're in your ambulatory practice or in the hospital, we have a travel navigator that pops up and asks these questions so that we can actually remember on each and every patient to ask, what's your travel history? Have you been in? And the CDC pushes that to Epic. Epic pushes it to us. And so those things are updated on a frequent basis. We're trying to, if someone comes in and we do have a patient, we will have a patient, um, we're not going to transfer that patient to a specific hospital because we believe that the care that they need is really care that we can all render. So wherever that patient is, we're going to take care of them there. And you heard from uh, Dr. Oldfield the things that we need to do, and those are the things that we can do in all of our hospitals. Centera has 12 hospitals. We have seven here in Hampton Roads, and of course, the big hospital, our flagship, Norfolk General. But the things that we need to do, we can do in each of those hospitals. But we also need to think about the future. So things are changing, and you're seeing that patients are popping up all over the place. Wake County yesterday in North Carolina, just a matter of time before Virginia. Well, what if it's one patient? What if it's five patients? What if it's 20 patients? So one of the things that our team is doing is flexing about our thinking. What are we going to do if we have more patients than maybe a one or two? So putting those things and our plans into place. Communicating, communicating, communicating. Not too much. We don't want people to panic. But make sure that people have the right information at the right time. So we communicate to all of our employees, our members of the team, communicate to our physicians. And again, we have these meetings where we actually listen to them and they can give us direct feedback on things that are working or not. Um, of course, we need to monitor healthcare personnel for exposures, and that's not been a case now, but we will. And I think that what you heard was, if we use appropriate PPE, that shouldn't be an issue. Uh, one of the things that we learned with Ebola is that people know how to don their PPE, but sometimes with the doffing of the PPE, they don't do it right. So again, we will go back and we'll educate and we'll train and we'll train and we'll train to make sure that people understand exactly how to keep themselves safe. And then, of course, managing impact on our patients, on our staff, our medical staff, and impact on operations. Because we don't want to completely stop operations to take care of a patient if the other 25 people that are coming in with COPD exacerbation or having an MI, we can't take care of them. So we've got to make sure that we flex to take care of all of these patients. So again, we monitor the situation 24-7. Uh, our emergency manager, I go into her cube every morning. She's got six screens up there, and she's looking at everything, and we have a debrief first thing in the morning. Uh, there's something going on at night. I got a text the other night at 3 in the morning. It's We were always looking, always trying to understand what's happening, what's changing. And of course, talking to our partners, because our partners will give us information about what we need to do or to change differently. We put together a field guide. It's a pretty large field guide that sort of walks step by step by step. So 
sort of a checklist for what do you do if someone shows up? What do you do if someone shows up in your office? What do you do if someone calls you from home? What do you do if someone shows up in the ED? So we sort of have tried to plan for those things so that our physicians and providers and nurses know what to do when those patients show up. And again, I mentioned we do travel screening for everybody. I think that's very, very important. It was easy at first, just, you know, if you're coming out of China, and then now it's, well, if you're coming out of maybe Iran, if you're coming out of South Korea, uh, Japan, the Washington State, you mentioned that. So, you know, we need to think about who do we screen for. And so I think everybody's on high alert and very, people are very sensitive to that. And I would also say it's not just screening for people that are coming to us, but what if, what if I decide, you know, I want to go to Italy for a great trip in Tuscany and have some great wine? Well, is, is that putting me at risk? Is that putting my team at risk if I go there because I may be asymptomatic and I come back? So those are the kinds of questions we have to think through. So again, the exposure to other patients and visitors and staff. Again, we have been collaborating every day with the Eastern Virginia Healthcare Collaborative, the, um, of understanding what are people doing, what's the military doing in this area, what are the other hospitals doing. We talked to the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association, the Virginia Department of Health. We were on calls with the CDC, trying to understand what people are saying, because we want to have a unified response. I spoke to a physician yesterday, said, it's really important for everybody to have the same response, because if I go to Riverside in the morning, and Mary Immaculate in the afternoon, and then to Sentara that evening, I want to make sure that we're doing the same thing, because it's very, very confusing. So we want to make sure we're on the same page, and I think we're doing a pretty good job of talking to each other, the other state agencies as well. Um, and if someone comes in and we're, they're a uh, PUI, then we actually will do the appropriate things that the VDH and the CDC is telling us to do. We isolate those patients, we do the needful, and we keep ourselves safe, and we keep our staff and employees safe. And of course, we have to look where people are going. So if I decide to go to Italy, then I need to make sure I check in when I come back. And we just do a, a screening within Sentara to make sure that what we don't want to do is we don't want me to bring it back and expose the rest of our team. And again, just reemphasizing the importance of talking to other agencies, talking to other people, talking to experts. Uh, Dr. Oldfield has graciously agreed to, again, talk with me and other physicians on Friday. Again, he was with us earlier today. I'm hearing him talk tonight. And I'm sure that when Friday rolls around, things are going to be different, but that's okay as long as we have our subject matter experts sort of giving us advice on a day-by-day -day basis, looking at the CDC website, talking to the people at VDH and the VHHA, I think we're going to be pretty good on top of these things. Thank you much. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jim Reddick. I'm the Director of Emergency Preparedness and Response for the City of Norfolk, and I suspect my presentation will probably be a lot more technical than the ones to my left. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so I will be brief. Uh, our role from the city, um, we plan for disasters all the time. In fact, to define what emergency management is, uh, the elevator answer is typically we tell people things they don't want to hear to spend money they don't have on things they don't think will ever happen. Um, so we are always focused on what if. So from messaging, we want to keep it real. We heard that earlier. We want actionable, timely, accurate, accessible information. Uh, I can tell you that public health is the subject matter expert for this. So we rely on their messaging, and that's what we relay. But in the background, we're always thinking what if. What if we get that first case? When we get that first case? How bad can it be? And then we work through those processes. I can tell you, and I probably won't rely too much on these uh, on, on, on my slides. Um, but I can tell you, one, the, the hazards for which we plan, natural, all hazards, uh, natural, technical, and man-made, all have a health component to them. 
I think we'd all agree with that. Um, I can also tell you that we work with public, private, not-for-profit, higher education, military, and the faith community. So what I would like for you to know is, one, we have a plan. We have a plan that has been built on previous incidents like Ebola, like SARS, like all these other things, and the plan gets better and better each time. The guidance that we get, we update our plans. We updated our plans this morning based on the latest guidance. And those plans are all of our plans. So those plans that we have are online. So if you go to Norfolk.gov and search for Team Norfolk plans, you'll know what we know. You'll know how we're going to do things and the whys behind it. Because Amanda Ripley, I don't know if you know her, the author who wrote The Unthinkable, Those Who Survive Disasters and Why, it's all about ensuring everyone understands the plan. It would not be right for us to tell you that we're going to do isolation and quarantine based on uh, Dr. Lindsay's uh, orders. Uh, and, and just to be clear, our mission is to support public health's mission. So obviously they're not resourced to do everything that they may need to do, and that's when we bring the team of partners uh, to bear. So again, Amanda Ripley is unthinkable. We want to explain the whys and the hows so you understand the whys and hows and hopefully make good decisions based on that information. Again, I don't want to be a hoarder of information. I want you to have the experience excuse me, the information on which you need to make your decisions at your household level, your business, your faith community, wherever else that you're going to have to decide on what you're going to do during disasters. We want to share the same information and resources that we have with you. So these are some of the things that we plan for. Um, so again, uh, we appreciate the blue skies, peacetime blue skies, but we're always planning for those worst case uh, scenarios. We do have, oh, excuse me, we do have the plans, all hazards, and we have a team. So Team Norfolk, to me, is that culmination of public, private, not-for-profit, higher education, military, and faith community. When you consider, when I look into this crowd, and when I consider our community as a whole, the talents, the resources, the expertise, we have a lot of things, a lot of excellence in Norfolk and the Hampton Roads region. So again, when I say this is our plan, I mean our plan, and I would love to hear what you could bring to the table based on the resources and the responsibilities in these plans. But our local emergency planning committee is a group that meets uh, semi-monthly, and we are always focused on the latest information. We have a, it's funny because we have a calendar of events for every month we're going to meet, but life happens, and so whatever that, that incident is that's going on, that's what we're going to talk about, and we're going to go line by line through our plan to make sure that everyone understands. Likewise, we're looking at other areas that are experiencing a greater impact of the coronavirus right now. So King County, King County did a webinar earlier today. I'm watching that to see what we can learn from them. What are some of the things that they're doing? Uh, what are some of the things that we can learn from that they're not doing? Uh, but again, if we're not taking advantage of those opportunities, then we're wrong because they're opportunities to improve our plans at a community level. I do want to share with you some of the partners with whom we plan, train, and exercise. Uh, and respond. And I won't read all these, but I want you to know that it is not solely a government response. It can't be a government response. We're going to do the best that we can, but we're reliant on and we work with and have, most importantly, relationships with somebody from every one of these organizations. Now, just to stop right here, because one of the other things that I'm focused on are barriers. Over 20% poverty in Norfolk. That's a barrier. One of my focuses is on what if folks can't meet their most basic needs, like feeding their family, paying their bills, and the like. So when I go out and say, get flood insurance, that's a self-fulfillment need, and it's, it's really a dream that you know, is unrealistic. So we're trying to reach those who are out in the community, working with our CSBs, our community services boards, uh, Department of Human Services, our neighborhood development, to find out, really help identify what's been termed the least, the last, and the lost, so we can make sure that they get the assistance that they need. Folks who are resourced, we hope make good decisions based on the information that we give them. Some folks are not in a position to make those decisions, and we have to help them during peacetime blue skies. And hopefully while we do that, we build trust and relationships so then again we're all on the same page when there is a disaster uh case in point 
Meals on Wheels, those who are homebound and reliant on home delivered meals for their sustenance. What happens when there is, you know, a, an order for social distancing or the like? Is that operation impacted? We work with Centera Meals on Wheels and Senior Services of Southern, uh, Southern Virginia and others who provide those services to make sure that we don't have a disaster within a disaster for folks not getting those basic needs. So again, that's from an ESF-6, a mass care, housing, and human services perspective, that is a huge concern of mine, is making sure that folks can meet their most basic needs so eventually that they get to those self-fulfillment needs of disaster preparedness. The more of our partners, uh, probably a lot of them in this room, some traditional, some non-traditional. How many of you are students in here? I'd love to work with you. And not only work with you and build that, that bench strength during a disaster, get you experience on your resumes as well. The opportunities are there. Uh, it's just a conversation and, and a plan. So we have that uh, in advance of a disaster. During the disaster is not the time to come uh, to the Emergency Operations Center or ask how you can help. Because I can tell you there are affiliated volunteers and there's unaffiliated volunteers. Affiliated volunteers, and I'll get to that slide, we know who you are. We know the organizations with whom you're working. Uh, typically, there's background checks. We know the tasks, tasks that you're able to do, and we make those specific requests. Unaffiliated volunteers, we have no idea who you are, what your intentions are, good, bad, or otherwise, um, and essentially, you're going to sit on the bench until we figure out how we can connect you to someone. So you're going to be frustrated because you're not doing what you want to do. We're frustrated because you're consuming the resources that we have for the survivors or the responders. So we need to get you affiliated now so we can get you plugged in so you can be part of that, that effort uh, when the disaster does come. I apologize for the acronyms. Obviously, Norfolk State University, Old Dominion, um, uh, Naval Operating Base, Naval Station Norfolk, as well as Joint Expeditionary Base, Little Creek, Fort Story. Uh, so again, various sectors and levels of government with the intention of unity of effort and unity of message. Speaking of messages, so external affairs. Uh, Larry Hill, where are you? Back there. So that is a gentleman you want to speak with as well. Uh, recognize Larry Hill from the Virginia Department of Health, their public information officer. So again, the information I get from him and Dr. Lindsay is what we are relaying, and we would ask you to relay it as well. I mean, that, that is the official source of information on which we rely and spread out in the community. But again, we have to have consistent and unified and accessible messaging. Uh, to quote Ben Franklin, and I'm sure none of you are around during that time, uh, we must all hang together or we'll hang separately. So if you can imagine us sending different messages from different agencies, the perception, rightfully so, would be that we don't know what we're doing. I will take this opportunity to again recognize our media partners. Uh, thank you for the work that you guys do in helping get the information out. Uh, and also making sure that we replace any fear or confusion with factual information. You guys do a great job during this uh, and other incidents as well. And then the affiliated volunteers. Uh, again, this is not a complete list, but these are a lot of the agencies, organizations with whom we work. Uh, we know who they are, and I can't tell you the value that they bring to the team. I'll speed by this because Dr. Lindsay already mentioned this, but part of our role in emergency management is to understand what's going on from all the different agencies. We read everyone's plans to make sure that there's no duplications, there's no conflicts, and we have that overarching plan that you have access to because it's all of our plan. So you would know when you read our plan what public health is doing in terms of surveillance, you'd know what the Coast Guard's doing, the Office of Public Schools, what the airport's doing, as well as 911. If someone calls 911 and they're expressing symptoms of then there are specific questions that we ask for our first responders so they don't become um, you know, impacted as well. So Dr. Lindsay already explained how we work together. She mentioned the incident command system, and it's all about unity of effort, one team, one fight. So we break down those silos of excellence. We put together one structure so there is flow of information up, down, horizontal. We're all on the same page. We all have shared, unified goals and objectives. We all have one message from Larry uh, and Dr. Lindsay, and make sure that we're all working together. So again, regardless of sector or level of government, you work into this structure, and that establishes that all may, may serve as one. And obviously, it gets expanded uh, based on the incident. It's being used because every locality in Hampton Roads and mostly through the nation formally adopted the National Incident Management System, and ICS in particular, the Incident Command System, 
in order to receive Homeland Security, excuse me, Homeland Security grant dollars. So it's required at our level. The governor already adopted it at the at the state level and required it through executive order, and it's also required at the federal level. So that is the game. That is the game by which we all work in the same sandbox together. That's what we should be using, and that's what we're using here in Norfolk. And of course, uh, it was mentioned uh, situational awareness, making sure that we're sharing the information among our partner agencies as well as the community. And there are tools that we have for that that we use for not only coronavirus, but also Hurricane Dorian, Florence, the winter storms that we do get or don't get. Uh, we're all about sharing information as frequently uh, and as effectively as possible. So with that, I'll end and feel free to contact me with any questions after this event or certainly during the panel. Thank you for your time. So good evening. So in the interest of time, I'm going to th go through my slides very quickly. As a result, the exam that we were going to have at the end, I have canceled it. <laughs> so I'm going to leave as much time as possible for your uh, questions here. And first, I want to also recognize my colleague, Bob Alpina, who uh, helped me work with this uh, presentation here. So Bob, if you want to just raise your hand real quick. There you go. OK, we're going to go through this. It's going to be really quick. First of all, Wall Street Journal, $3.6 trillion wake-up call. Uh, this is what the stock market lost in like the seven day trading days up through this past Monday uh, as the market value of investments wiped out. Why is China such a big impact and how we're doing it? We've already heard we're in a global environment. China is the world's second largest economy. Ours is the first. In 2003 with SARS, China only made up 4% of the global economy. Now it's 16%. Global cost of SARS was estimated at $40 billion. Uh, right now, uh, PP, uh, experts are predicting China's economy will contract by 2 to 3% in the first quarter, and their annual GDP growth is going to cut in half from 6 to 3%. Uh, China is also the world leader in exports and goods and services, as many of you probably suspect. They have the largest consumer base, 1.4 billion people to consume things. We have about one-fourth of that. Uh, so really what the impact is, disrupt, disruption in China's manufacturing capacity greatly impacts the world supply chain. They uh, make a lot of different things to include uh, automobiles, uh, automobile components. Key thing here, 15% of all cars manufactured in the U.S. probably have parts from China. They also do a lot of uh, new technologies. Bottom bullet, 80% of the supply of antibiotics in the U.S comes from China, 80%. Okay, Chinese exports, the US, you can see there really quick. Impact to the world and the US economy. So COVID-19 will have a larger impact than SARS. Uh, world Bank estimates something like this could cost $570 billion. Global G GDP growth is going from three to 2.4% in a contained scenario not a full-blown, okay? Uh, our GDP is scheduled to drop, or predicted to drop from 2.3 to 1.9%. And remember, two-thirds of our gross domestic product is consumer spending, what folks in this room spend each and every day. Uh, price of crude oil has dropped 20% in uh, this year alone. Interest rates have hit record lows. Travel industries, you can imagine, significantly impacted. Uh, some estimates are saying a hundred billion dollar impact uh, on uh, travel, including airlines, hotels, you name it. Major conferences being canceled at this point. Factories around the world may start shutting down due to interruptions in global supply chain. There's always already discussions and uh, stories of some car manufacturers uh, having to uh, go and personally fly people, suitcases, get parts from factories, keep their uh, manufacturing lines. Uh, pr productive. Um, exports to China, real quick, uh, Virginia, $1.2 billion of exports to China in 2018. Uh, Port of Virginia, uh, their number one trading partner is China. They predict a 6 to 8% decrease in shipping volumes right now as a result. Uh, to compare that, LA port is 25% at this point. So oh, much better for us. Here's what we uh, export to China on the left, on the commodities and uh, the export markets. So China's number two. We 
uh, so export a lot of things to China. Um, what's the impact, of course? Soybean prices down, wheat prices down, corn prices down, cattle prices down, law, uh, hog prices down. All these farmers in Virginia are suffering because of this. Millfield Foods, if uh, many of you don't know, is owned by a Chinese company. Uh, so we're there. Impact on academics. International students, $41 billion to the U.S. economy. China is the largest source of foreign students in the U.S. So a lot of recruitment abroad and study of our programs have been suspended. I was talking to Dr. Dobrin about uh, Virginia Wesleyan pulling all their students back. As you can see, 37,000 American students studied in Italy in uh, 17 and 18, and 12,000 students studied in China. So overall, Virginia, 20,000 international students, $758 million. Here's some uh, local universities. Uh, look at the very bottom. They estimate every seven international students creates three U.S. jobs. So if the flow of international students stops, it could have a serious impact on the academic environment. Lastly, impact on consumers, some positive, lower gas prices, lower mortgage interest rates, lower costs from some agricultural products, the negative, potential job loss due to supply disruptions, and slower consumer spending. That's really going to be the key. If the consumer stops spending, we are going to uh, really feel it. Uh, stock market drop negatively impacts investments. For all those of you here who have uh, 401ks and retirement plans, you've probably seen it. Uh, and lower interest income on retirees, that's a negative. That's it. So hopefully, uh, I know by, by quick, but want to leave as much time for uh, your questions. Thank you. So we're, uh, we're not going to get our 30 minutes in, obviously. Uh, I want to thank our panelists. If you give them another round of applause here. One of the things you, you may may be aware of is that they were asked to present on some very in-depth detailed information in a very quick amount of time so uh, each of them did an excellent job with that we've got uh, this being live stream so we've got some folks online that might have questions we've got two microphones dr campbell's on that side and i'll hang on this one and we will start taking questions i have an online okay this is an online question i've seen things going around on social media stating certain races are immune to the virus. Does this have any truth to it? I can say no, and there's a lot of misinformation going around on social media. It's really sad, actually, what's, uh, what's being said, and it's, it's detrimental. There are, there are books that have come out that are completely erroneous. I mean, it's a lot of, you have to watch out for this misinformation. Good evening. My name is Jordana Brevin Johnson. I'm a Presbyterian minister, pastoral counselor, but my husband Larry Johnson is in K909, currently in Centera Norfolk General Hospital. He has lots of complicated issues. First of all, he's a Zollinger Ellison patient, which he had therapeutic endoscope procedure on December 13th. Dr. Park Perec removed that tumor and his body does not absorb stuff well enough. Second of all, he has myasthenia gravis, which lo lowers his immune system. And, in, uh, and he also is back in for the second time with crypto meningitis. Currently, as I am here, because I promised him, and I have a question, is this going to be streamed through the hospital network so my husband can see this? Not. Okay. All right. The crypto meningitis for the second time, and he has not had a vaccine, and I'll explain that in a minute. But currently, he's receiving a bolus. He's already had magnesium, which is one of 41 allergies for my husband, and part of the reason he hasn't had a flu shot nor me is because he cannot take live vaccines. There are 41, if you don't know, for um, myasthenia gravis, there are 41 allergies. 
right now. Currently, he's receiving the bolas. And this is our last night here. Thank God we go home and we're going to go to the beach, which is another question on Sunday. In, we live in North Carolina. So um, he's receiving the bolus. Then he's receiving ampitericin B. And then the bolus tonight, he ha also had potassium replaced and his um, magnesium, which is very dicey with a myasthenia gravis patient. It's on one of those 41 allergies. It was so low today and two days ago and whatever days ago. The danger with that is they are monitoring that very carefully and I'm trying not to take too much time because the danger is it can cause heart issues, which he has uh, paroxysmal tachycardia if it goes too low. If it goes too high, he can have muscle weakness. We're going on vacation. We live in North Carolina. We're going to Atlantic Beach Sunday. But I need to know what steps I need to do to take care of my husband. Thank you. And you think right now there's very low risk in North Carolina of COVID-19. Uh, there's only the one case in North Carolina so far, so I think the risk is very minimal. He'd be more at risk of influenza, which has very high activity in North Carolina right now. Uh, so he wants to do, uh, you know, cover his uh, face. He wants to do social distancing. You wouldn't want him around crowds, um, things like that. Maybe uh, maybe what would be best is after the presentations, we can have you come up and uh, maybe speak with one of the physicians here about your husband's case. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. We were just told that 80% of the antibiotics are manufactured in China. My concern is what about other medicines? Are we going to have a shortage of other medicines that are so necessary for people to take? Yeah, so the question is, uh, the uh, antibiotics, what about others? They're, most of the generics are made in China for blood pressure, et cetera. And the more uh, disconcerting thing is most of the ones that aren't made in China are made in India. And India announced today that no exports of generic drugs could be made without government approval because they're afraid they'll be in a situation where they won't have access to generics. So it's going to be much worse than just yeah. what's lacking from China. Take one online while you're skipping it. Okay. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. No, please, go right uh, Thank you, first of all, for the wonderful presentation. It was very great information. Um, I'm here for, from Anthem Corporation. Uh, I'm an alumni, first of all, so it's great to be back here seeing all the great work you guys are doing. Uh, we have about 2,500 employees in that one building, and it, uh, a lot of people travel, and we have people from different nationalities. Uh, I'm here uh, on behalf of the company to take notes, which I'm going to present tomorrow. Uh, in addition to what you've told us, is there anything, um, you know, immediate that you would recommend? Uh, like, I have a team of 40 people that are, uh, report to me, but they travel. You know, we have remote teams, and they, they travel at different places. Is it recommended to kind of put a freeze on travel and kind of promote remote work? What's your take on that? I would recommend that you stay up to date with the CDC website and um, uh, follow, look at the travel advisories there and, and take that into consideration. Um, and the basic practices that we, you know, we discussed in terms of uh, hand washing, covering coughs, social distancing, staying away from people who may be ill. Uh, but beyond, beyond that, um, no specific recommendations for travel to specific areas except what we see from CDC. 
um, it is important to stay very current and follow that closely because it is obviously a very rapidly evolving situation. Man. So one of the other plans that we've been working on for the city is our continuity of operations plan. And, and I'm hoping every organization represented here has one uh, where you look at your, your essential functions. So if you do have an impact on staffing, you know, where you really focus your efforts on. But I'll, I'll speak on behalf of our information technology director who almost had a heart attack when I told him how many people in the organization wanted to telework. So I would just encourage folks to have that conversation with their IT department to see what that bandwidth capability is uh, before having a, a potential unrealistic expectation that everyone would be able to do that telework. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I have an online question from Miriam. What is the procedure if you travel to France or Germany, currently not classified as level two or three, but relatively close to Italy, and return to the U.S.? Should you self-quarantine prior to returning to work, even when you are not feeling sick? I personally would not self-quarantine unless I went to an area with active known transmission. So if I was returning from northern Italy, Milan, something like that, I would uh, definitely consider it. Same thing, Iran, we've already had imported cases into New York City from Iran. We've had imported cases into Florida and Newport, Rhode Island from um, Italy. So those are the areas, those four big areas are where I would consider self-quarantine. Any individual uh, returning from um, another country is welcome to call the health department for, for updates or questions if they have concerns. Um, if they are coming back to their home destination from an international origin and it is a, a country um, um, felt to be affected by community transmission, they will be hearing from us and they will probably um, be hearing from someone as they enter the country as well um, with that basic screening for symptomatology and travel history. Hi, my name is Monica Clark. I have three questions. How was China's water contaminated? How, how did China dispose of those contaminated items and, and those bodies, and all those people that died? And how long does this virus stay on the surface? Well, we know it can survive on surfaces for a limited amount of time. It depends on the humidity, the temperature, uh, whether it's hours or not. But I'm not aware of any water contamination uh, in China that was an issue. Or bodies. Or bodies. Bodies. Well, the body. How was the body contamination yeah. disposed of? I don't know how those, those bodies were uh, disposed of. Hey, my name is uh, Glenn Hookie. I'm a resident physician here at EVMS. Um, my question is about the seasonality of past coronaviruses and how they might be applied to uh, this coronavirus, whether when we might expect our cases to the curve might bend based just on seasonality. Um, and my second question is reinfectivity. Um, once we have any data on people who get the disease, are they immune afterwards? We don't have any data yet on immunity. We're presuming it's going to be the same as others. That if you survive, you're going to have durable immunity. We don't know how long. Uh, as far as uh, coronaviruses, the other ones, remember we said that um, if you are have uh, significant symptoms, you don't excrete virus until you become symptomatic, you can control it. So with SARS, it was controlled in five months. That was the classic. Uh, let's go back to pandemic flu, which might be more like this in 2009. The first U.S. cases didn't even occur till April. So there's nothing magic about viruses in April. It then continued through the summer. It decreased in late summer. And then there was a second hump. And you often see that where you have a winding down and then it comes back. And it continued through November at a very high level. And then that was when we got the pandemic flu vaccine. 
and it slightly went down, but it didn't really go away till May of 2010. So pandemic flu circulated for 13 months. And now it's endemic and it's estimated we'd have 100 million cases of pandemic flu as the H1N1 as it recirculates each year. And so it's unpredictable what this is gonna do, but I can't imagine it's gonna follow seasonality. There's a question in the back, Dr. Cameron. I'd like to know if this event has been recorded and if so, if it will be made available to the public and how so. And my second question is, I know that in 34, 35 states, price gouging is illegal. Do any of you know if the price gouging that was described in this presentation, the Purell, for instance, on Amazon, if anyone is taking action to prevent price gouging? So my understanding about the Amazon uh, issue, and I'm, you know, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but Amazon actually took those off to prevent the price gouging. Um, and when price gouging takes place during any type of disaster, the Attorney General's office in Richmond would certainly address that, and there's opportunities or, or ways by which that could be reported. So, I, I can't speak on the recording, though, uh, on the offering. Yeah, I, I can speak on that. Uh, so the, the event is being live streamed. Some people RSVP for the online version of this, and you see the questions. Um, it is being recorded, so we can uh, therefore post it what we'll need is to be able to get to you where that posting is. So if you are SVP to this event, then we have you already. If you signed in uh, legibly, I might add, <laughs> and the sign-in sheet and you put your email address, then we can contact you that way. If you haven't done either of those, make sure you do that, uh, the second one on the way out. Hi, um, I'm glad uh, this young man over here uh, asked about the seasonality of the virus because the only thing that came to mind for me was what the city of Virginia Beach may do in terms of preparation for something in the water, which is scheduled to happen in about seven weeks. And with you know um, discussion of it's not a matter of when or whether or not if coronavirus will continue to happen, but more so when. I'm a little nervous because I already paid my money for those tickets. So having all those people, <laughs> I feel like everyone's really pretty much going to be at risk. So can you touch um, basis on, you know, what the city of Virginia Beach or perhaps other neighboring cities are preparing, preparing for with such a large crowd that, you know, will likely attend for that week of festivities? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so this I'd part like of the program will be uh, edited, right? No, I mean, there's really no secret. Um, it's too early to tell if there would be any type of cancellation or not, but we would be doing our due diligence if we look ahead on the calendar of what special events are occurring uh, and having a, a, a threshold by which we would make that decision. Certainly don't want to speak on behalf of Virginia Beach, uh, but I know we're doing something similar, and, and that is, again, just you know, taking a, an inventory of what special events are coming up uh, and having a, a, a process once decisions are made from the health department, you know, what would need to be canceled and whatnot. So that is just one event of many uh, that we would be looking at. So as director of the Virginia Beach Health Department as well, oh, good I can speak. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I can tell you that we are, are, are working with um, other emergency responders and planners in the city to plan and look ahead at what steps we may need to take uh, in the event or when uh, there is community-level transmission in the country as well as in, in our state. Um, also, I'm a part of a group uh, that is working at the Virginia Department of Health state level looking at issues like events and how we might want to think through that process. Um, and monitoring, our active monitoring of disease activity and knowing where and, and when um, uh, transmission has evolved uh, in our state and across the country will be an important part of that as well as other triggers. It's not as straightforward as just knowing um, numbers and transmission to make that determination or specific key objectives that we'd be looking at trying to achieve through social distance, distancing 
and looking at whether or not that would be an effective measure. So we're not at that point yet of making a decision of whether or not that specific event or others would be canceled. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, th I think uh, we're going to need to stop here. There, I know we didn't get to everyone's questions, but we do have some folks uh, that would be, I'm sure, willing to stay and, and answer some things. want to thank everyone for attending tonight. And thank you once again. Everybody be safe. Remember all these protective measures you can take. Thank you for coming. Thank you.